will be starting in a minute. Yes. Okay, we had quite a few people register, so we will start here shortly. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, what does it look like, Manny? 18. Okay. Yeah, we should get going, eh? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's start, you guys. So uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, the Net Culture Night online. This is the first one we're hosting for uh, this fall semester. And we have another one scheduled for November. So this evening, um, our presenter is uh, Mr. Terry Teller. And I'll switch it over to him so that he can um, introduce himself. Um, hello, my name is uh, Terry Teller. I'm originally from Lukachuka, Arizona. Um, some of you probably know me as Daybreak Warrior on YouTube. <clears throat> I am from the Water Flows Together clan, born for the Coyote Past people. My maternal grandparents are from the Sleeping Rock clan, and my paternal grandparents are from the one who walks flow. Um, I currently live here in Farmington, New Mexico. Uh, I work over at Northern Navajo Medical Center as a pharmacist. That's that's a little about um, myself. Um, in turn, I, I really am thankful that I was invited to speak. <laughs> I'm I'm thankful for that. Um, essentially, uh, I try to um, do a lot with um, Native Navajo language revitalization, as you have seen my um, YouTube projects. Um, in other in terms of other projects that I've been involved with, I was uh, the voice for. Luke Skywalker for the Navajo Dub version. And I was also the uh, voice for Anchor, the hammerhead shark in the, in the movie Fighting Nemo that was translated into Navajo as well. And um, I don't know if you want me to, um, that's, and that's like in terms of my introduction. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to share anything else or continue on with other things. Um. No, it, no, it's up to you. Yeah, it's a great introduction. Thank you, Terry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's essentially, <clears throat> how should I begin this presentation? I guess, first of all, Navajo language um, revitalization. Essentially, um, growing up on the reservation, even though I was in the center of the reservation, I I only understood parts of Navajo. I didn't speak Navajo for a long time. Essentially, I kind of grew up in elementary school. I heard it. I really didn't speak it too well. 
And as I got older, I feel like I got into that mindset of I was embarrassed of, of sounding resy, being resy. I wanted to imitate everything that I saw off the reservation when I went to Albuquerque, when I went to Phoenix. I really wanted to not come off as being from the reservation. Once I graduated from high school and moved to the to Albuquerque, I realized what an asset it is to actually be Navajo, what it is to be Native American and, and my language. And I really got a I got a feel for my language itself. So it was at that time that I really started to learn Navajo. Um, <clears throat> I took a Navajo language course over at um, UNM. I was, um, some of you may remember Roseanne Willink. I don't know if she's still there, but uh, she, uh, she was my instructor. I mean, hearing, being, living on the reservation, I, I, I was familiar with hearing things, sentences speaking back to them, or she keeping them together in my head that was. So I, I was basically learning from scratch from the beginning on how to say things, what, how to break down words, how to really um, use my language in a meaningful way. And that's where I started. I started by, I, there's a book that I had picked up from UNM and it answered a lot of, it really helped me out. It was a really good um, starting point for me. It's called Navajo Made Easier. And that I feel like was a really good book for me to learn from. It started with the basics of, on um, the foundations of things that I didn't know too well. And then it slowly increased my vocabulary on things I didn't know. It filled in those little gaps that I was unclear of when I was learning Navajo. So I started there. And then I, I worked at a nursing home with elderly. And essentially it was there that I was, um, I would practice what I learned. And sometimes I would get it wrong. And I think that's, that's the thing is when you're learning Navajo, you shouldn't be afraid of getting it wrong. It's when you get it wrong that you really learn your language really well. So I feel like people shouldn't be afraid to say it incorrectly. It's, learn, it's saying it incorrectly that you really learn how to say it more correctly and why you're wrong. Um, when I was getting somebody's um, medications together, I said, Nahasht ehoshla. And Nahasht ehoshla is a phrase that you would use if you were getting an area space together, if you were fixing somebody's room. And I was using it because I, I did understand that it meant to prepare something and I thought I could automatically say it about medications. But it was an elderly person who said, no, you don't say it for that. If you fix the room for somebody, if you got the bed ready, if you got it fixed ready, that's when you say it. And so I will always remember that when I said it wrong, that's the context you use it in. So I, I learned it that way. So I started small. I was working in healthcare and I was learning little phrases like, uh, <clears throat> we're going to get your labs done. And I was directing people on the where to go. And I would ask my mom, I would say, how do you say these things? teach me how to say these things. I didn't know how to spell Navajo at that time. I essentially was writing it the best I could. <clears throat> My mom told me to get a notebook and write down everything that I was learning. That's what I did. I got a notebook and I wrote down everything that I was learning, I wrote it all, in the, all down, whether it was correct or not. And I would repeat it and if it was wrong, I, my mom would correct me. And I asked a lot. Um, later on, we went to reporting, which kind of, I badgered her less, but I wrote it all down. Um, and I didn't grow up in a, um, in a, uh, essentially I grew up in a Christian home. I wasn't exposed to Navajo culture. So how I really learned 
how to actually write Navajo is I was reading the Navajo Bible. I was reading sections and portions and reading it. Um, I went, I started with the book of Matthew and every word in there, I wrote down what it meant, what it was, how to use it. I wrote every little word. I, I went started from Matthew um, chapter one, verse one, went and broke down every word. And by the time I got to chapter 10, I had a feel for how the sentence shows. And it, it made clear in my mind how the sense, how the words broke up. So I would say that what I really learned Navajo from was the Navajo Bible. And of course my parents. Um, and I would I would essentially try to always reference them and ask them, how do you say these things? <clears throat> when my grandma was alive, I spent a lot of time with her. I spent a lot of time talking with her, asking her stories. And they, I didn't understand a lot of it at the time. I took the time to record everything that she said. So those are what I posted on YouTube. So when you see those stories about the long walk, um, when you see those stories about her singing songs, and I always just thought she would be around forever. And I think at this point, I'm glad that I recorded those. I didn't think that she would be gone this soon. And um, I'm very thankful that I, I captured all that while she was alive. And I spoke to her and off camera, I, I asked her about scenarios and words and that sort of thing. And it was from her that uh, we, I would go to my grandma's house and I had a gospel song, a hymnal book, and we would sing hymnals and I would have my hymnal book and I would write down the words that I didn't know. The words that I didn't know, I would ask her, how else can you use this? How else can you use that? And I think that's how in the videos that I'm doing now, I'm hearing it that way. Certain words, you can't use it for everything. You can't, you can't, like I, like I was, if any of you had seen my latest video on masks, that the nifbath, you can't use it to say cover everything. You can't say use that for a table um, that has specific scenarios and how you use it. So I would ask my grandma, how do you use these words? And I would ask my parents. And so I, it was through those songbooks that I, that I, I, I learned what the songs were about. And I, at that time, I didn't want to just keep it to myself. That's why you see on my YouTube page, um, those same hymnals that I sing with my grandma, broken down word for word what they mean. I'm not going to teach something that I didn't know about. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I, living on the reservation, I've heard traditional Navajo prayers. Yes, um, you, I've been exposed externally to ceremonies. I know that they're going on, but I don't know any of that. So for that reason, if you watch my videos, I don't cover a lot of Navajo culture because that's not what I was born up with. That's not how I was raised. I was raised with um, Christianity. That's where I was brought up. And even then, so I don't, I don't try to teach something I don't know about, but I'll share what I know in terms of Navajo culture in terms of gospel songs and the Bible, because that's really where I learned Navajo. And at one time, um, we would we got in the habit of reading from the Navajo Bible every Sunday and every Tuesday. My dad's the pastor at a Saley Community Church. Um, and <clears throat> I used to do the offering messages. I used to sing the songs. I used to lead praise and worship on Sundays. Um, and that's, I was really active in church and we really got really involved with singing hymnals at church. So that's, I would say that I really learned um, Navajo language, um, words, sentences, structure, all from the Navajo Bible. And I think it's probably the best reference that I had. And if Roseanne Willink was watching, she will vouch for the fact that I used to go to her office and I used to like take my Navajo Bible and I used to ask her, what do these words mean? What do these words mean? And I didn't care if there were other students in the room. There's a, the chief medical officer in Fort Defiance, his name is Aaron Price. 
we were in school together and he was also taking that language courses. And he was taking an exam and President Malik was totally fine with me going into her office hours for me to go there and still ask her questions even though Aaron Price was in the room. Dr. Price, he was there. And I, I took advantage of the time that I had. If she was willing to let me learn, I'll, I'll take it. So that's when my parents were still in Dubai and I was in Arizona, I was in Albuquerque and I took advantage of that time. And so it was from there that I, I started like learning a lot. And then I figured I would continue by, I, I, I shouldn't like keep it a secret on, on what I'm learning that I should share with everyone. So <clears throat> that's where I essentially started the YouTube videos. Um, and essentially, um, I kind of got into a little trouble when I posted things without sharing it with my mom. And she's like, you're not saying this right. You're not saying that right. So there came a point to where I started getting things verified with by my parents. There was a time when I was actually trying to learn from everyone. And I would come home and... Um, my mom would ask me, where are you learning that word from? Who taught you that? That's what she told me. She says, that's not how you're supposed to talk to um, but And so from there, I, I learned that I really should just focus on learning from one source. I, 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 and I, I remember I posted that in a video, and I hope I didn't insult any Navajo language instructors. I don't want them to think that I, I, I undervalue them because I think Navajo language instructors are in a hard place um, because they have to deal with the fact that we are speaking Navajo from different areas, but it's not necessarily different areas. I come from the mind process, uh, mindset that there's no really different dialects of Navajo. It's just that when you're younger, you're used to hearing a certain core set of words. But when they're said somewhere else, they're the same words, but a different um, tense context, but it's still the same word. Um, I've been to revivals all over the reservation from Torreon to Ojo Encino to Bird Springs to Navajo, to Navajo Mountain, where they speak really hard for Navajo. Well, and what I've learned from all that is Navajo is the same wherever you're from. Sure, there's little things like yes and zests, but those are minor things. They're little things. They're not dialect changes. But what people think are dialect changes is when you change your tenses, past tense, present tense, repetitive tenses. And I think when people just know one set of words, they think hearing it in a different way, they think it's a dialect change when it's not. So learning these things and what I learn, I try to present it the best way. But I've come to the point now to where I don't present it until I run it by my parents to say, is this correct? Am I portraying this correct? So what I'm trying to present is what I'm learning. I'm trying to present everything um, in the best light that I can. And I, I feel like the fact that I had to learn from really ground zero to where I've come. It's helped me really try to describe the, um, how difficult it is to learn that because I have to go through those difficulties myself, if that makes sense. Um, so I started, that's how I basically learned um, Navajo and that's how I learned how to write it. Essentially, I also started by trying to find ways in which to make it more popular. So I started doing memes. So I started making Navajo memes for fun, like, um, like enjoy your weekend, have a good day. That sort of thing. Anyway, I started making those memes to, to put it out there, to start putting it out there. <clears throat> and if somebody had issues with the way it was written, with what it was said, I didn't take anything negative about it. I just took it as a learning experience of, okay, let me run this by my parents and see what they say about how it should be said and the corrections and that sort of thing that can be made. And I, I would learn from all of those things and I continue to learn from the mistakes that I make. So I 
but I've come to the point where um, at work and everything, I've, I've learned, I've gone over certain things with my parents in terms of my work before, before I would, um, I, at first um, when I was working at Sailing Health Center, I was practicing praise and telling patients how to take their medications. The elderly there were very forgiving. They were very, they would teach me. And I think it's really at Sailing Health Center that it really grounded my understanding of Navajo language even further because I was having one-on-one -on -one contact, contact with native, only Navajo speaking elderly, only Navajo speaking elderly. <clears throat> so I've, I, then that's, I missed that. I've worked at uh, Sailing Health Center for 12 years and then I transferred to Shiprock. And essentially I, it, people speak more English in Shiprock, but um, every now and then you get that really old elderly Navajo who only speaks Navajo. And I've, I, I would say that I've come to the point to where I'm pretty proficient and where I can, I, I, I do pretty well in Navajo. I, I don't have much difficulty. I, I can interact with elderly pretty well. I can tell them directions, how to get through the hallways, how to get to where they need to go, how to take their medications. Um, if they need to get a new prescription, those sort of things I'm very comfortable with. It's those other things that I'm still practicing, like slang. I still have issues with slang because that's uh, my parents never talked to me in slang, so I'm still learning those things. And what I learn, I tear apart the words until I know how it works, and then I, then I, I share what I learn, and that's kind of how my, my, my channel has kind of evolved. <clears throat> um, and it was out of that that um, after these experiences and learning these things that I was just really glad that the whole Star Wars opportunity came up even. Um, my friend, um, his name is Emerson Begay. He was the one that emailed me and said, hey, this is going on. Um, they're doing interviews over in Wonder Rock for Star Wars. And I thought, man, that would be really nice to be here. <clears throat> so for all of this, before all this, me and my mom were watching um, the Miss Navajo pageant. And the contestants were asked how, if you were to say how to get from here to there, from here to this spot, to your home, how do you say it? And they struggle with it. And then I asked my mom, how, how would you say that? So she was, so we went over it like, um, Kuro, so we went through all of those words on how you would say that, like passing towns and everything. So we were having fun with that. I was learning how to say directions and how to say get from here to there. That's right. And it was fun. Little did I know when I was sitting for Star Wars. I, I really wasn't, I didn't know what to plan for. I just took the day off. I would thought I would hang out and go to Winter Rock and have some fun with it. And I even dressed up in my lights. I even wore my Luke Skywalker uniform and costume and had my lightsaber and was having fun. And on the way to Winter Rock, all the electricity went out. Everything totally went out. I'm one of those people who will not fill up their gas until it is almost empty. That's the kind of person I am. So essentially, I by the time I was leaving town, I thought, hey, I'm gonna stop at FINA, I'm gonna fill up my gas, and I'm gonna go into Winter Rock. Ran out of gas, and I was at the gas station like begging people for um, dollars because my credit card wouldn't work because the electricity was down. So I, they would only accept cash. So my card wasn't working. So eventually somebody gave me 10 bucks, which got me into Navajo where I filled up my gas and I showed up there. I showed up, sat for my interview, read the lines because I can read Navajo and they wanted to test my ability to speak Navajo. And that's where it came up. Tell us how to get from here to look at your bank. And because I practiced with my mom for that, because we were watching that um, video with Miss Navajo, I knew how to say how to get from Winter Rock to Luka Chupé all in all. I feel like um, a lot of times when 
I've, I've been learning. Um, it's really been God who's been helping me through a lot of this, um, giving me the information, what I need to know, what I need to learn, what I need to say, and I'm continuing to learn. I continue every day. Um, it's a daily process, and um, I essentially try to absorb it all the best I can. Um, and then when the opportunity to uh, come up to, uh, for Finding Nemo, I sat for it again and I got it. And I was really glad to be a part of all of that. I was glad to be to meet um, uh, Manuelito Wheeler, the, the curator at the Navajo Nation Museum, and his wife, Jan Wheeler, who was the Miss Navajo in that movie or in that documentary that I saw. So it was really nice to see her in person. And it's still nice to talk to her. It's still nice. And she's a, I think she would be a good person to talk about because she's on um, Facebook a lot. She teaches um, you how to say, how to cook things in Navajo, like how to make um, kneel down bread, how to make fry bread, all of that. She teaches you all in Navajo, entirely in Navajo. And I, she's an incredible resource. And I'm glad that I got to meet her through this whole Star Wars because She's the wife of Manny Lita Wheeler, who is the curator who started the whole um, move to put those movies in Navajo, Star Wars, and Finding Nemo. So I'm glad to be to to meet her through those things, to have that experience to meet all these people. Um, so essentially, that's kind of been um, my road with where I am right now and how I ended up on YouTube. And what it is that I do. Um, and um, that's pretty much what I want to share right now. Does anybody have any questions or anything right now? We have one in the chat. Uh, have have you had any feedback from elders on the movie? <clears throat> well, that's I, I have not. Um, I've, I've always wanted to see what the reaction would be if, if it was played in a nursing home. Um, but I haven't seen any. I've been looking for that myself to see if anybody has posted feedback, but I haven't seen anything myself. So I, I see a question there. It says, how long did it take for me to feel like I had a grasp on the language? I would say um, once I picked up a hitchhiker. Once I picked up a hitchhiker and he got in my vehicle and I was able to, to joke around with him, find out where he was going, drop him off where he needed to go. I feel like that's when I really um, had a really good feel for the language. Um, I mean, just being able to to tease elderly, um, I feel like that's that's um, that's the real um, critical um, part. Well, not critical, but that's when you know when you're able to joke around in Navajo. That's when you know that you have a, a good grasp for the language. <clears throat> There's and, another question. How uh, often? How often are you recognized from your videos? Um. I think early on I was I was recognized more often. Um, now that I'm now that I'm older and I've put on more weight, I don't look like that slim person that I used to be <laughs> in my original videos. So I feel like sometimes people will say, "Are you related to that YouTube guy? You guys sound the same." Or some people will be like, "Your voice sounds very familiar. I can't figure out, um, but I feel like I know you from somewhere." And then I'll just kind of breast it. I'm like, yeah, probably. I mean, I, I, I have a lot of relatives everywhere, um, but I, I don't um, I don't I don't throw myself out there. But I I essentially um, I essentially um, just kind of let them guess. And if they guess, then I'll I'll be honest. Like, yeah, I'm from I, I have a YouTube channel. My name is David Wood. Um, but I I don't I I I, I, like, I wait for them to make that connection first. <clears throat> and somebody put on here, um, how did I deal with growing up, not growing up speaking Navajo, but surrounded by people who can. 
Did I ever feel like an outsider? Um, I would say so. I, I feel like uh, my parents use it to their advantage very well when I was younger by saying things um, in Navajo that they didn't want us to know. Um, particularly um, my sister and brother and I. But now we're, we're coming to the part where we're learning more. And my brother has become very proficient as well. So my parents can't do that anymore. They can't say anything secretive about us. Um, and my brother came to that point one time. I guess um, he is uh, living at home with my parents and my aunts and uncles have dinner at our house a lot. And my brother is learning a lot through them. Now we have another set of relatives who didn't know that my brother was getting proficient and they were gossiping saying, should it, um, our brother has like a, a, a girlfriend and we want to ask Robbie if he knows where that girlfriend is from and if he knows anything and whatnot. And they were talking amongst themselves. And then after a while, my brother just kind of said, if you want to know about uncle's girlfriend, just ask him. And they had no idea that he understood everything that they were saying. But it's, it's coming to the point to where that me and my brother are getting more familiar, more proficient with the language that, that people can't talk about us anymore like that. Or they can't use the language to gossip, but we're getting a better feel for it. But I would say, I mean, I think um, feeling like an outsider, uh, yes and no. I, I feel like um, one, it is, um, I think it humbles me. I will never look down on somebody who can't speak the language because I know what that feels like. Somebody who has mastered the language and learned, I, I also feel proud for them that they've come to that level. I will always feel proud for people who, who take it on to learn. And it's a hard language. It really is a hard language. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think, um, I don't think negative of anybody who doesn't know their language. They, sometimes you just, even though you have exposure, thinking about it now, I, my parents spoke Navajo all the time. I heard that church for some reason when I was younger, that connection didn't click. It may be because all of my cousins at that time that I played with didn't speak Navajo, but they all spoke English. But it came at a time when my parents um, had a, I guess they wanted us to really learn English first to do well at school. And all of my aunts and uncles had that same perception because of the boarding school. And I'm not going to blame boarding school for everything, but I mean, we also got to take it upon ourselves to learn. Um, but that's that's why they made the decisions they did to teach us English more so that we would do better in school and we wouldn't have to worry about language differences. The, and I'm thankful for that because I'm, I'm doing well and um, I'm and sure I would have liked to have been able to learn more or speak um, fluently from childhood. But I think that that journey helps me be able to teach what I've learned, to teach um, how I um, see the language, how I break it down, and hopefully I can help make it digestible. Um, and somebody put, do you currently have certain Navajo words that are challenging to say and have to continue practicing them? <clears throat> Well, I think I think the the challenging thing is um, sometimes you can't literally translate things everything word for word, but you get the concept about it. Sometimes when I think about a phrase and I think I can't translate that in Navajo, then I'll ask somebody like, "How do you say this?" and they'll translate the same sentence and I'm like, "Oh, I could have thought of that, but I just I was trying to be too literal." I think sometimes um, being too literal, it's, I mean, getting the concepts by is still getting that information by. Some things can't be literally translated into Navajo from English, especially um, in terms of the culture aspects. And I feel like trying to do that makes it challenging, but it doesn't have to be that complex. I hope that answers that question. <clears throat> Another person, what is my advice for trying to learn Navajo? 
what can be done made to help people learn Navajo? Looking back, what would I have helped? What would have been more helpful to learn? So the first thing I would say is don't be afraid to get it wrong. Um, be honest about your abilities and what you can say. Um, there are people who, yeah, who won't help you. There are people who will judge your, your level of fluency. Just don't learn from them. <laughs> Choose somebody else who's going to be more forgiving. Um, and essentially, um, what I would say is use every little possibility. One of the things that I, I really found useful, <clears throat> my Nolly, she only spoke only Navajo, no English. And I, I tried to talk to her the best I could. I learned from her. But she be, she also had Parkinson's. There became a point in time when um, her disease progression was so advanced that she couldn't talk anymore, really. She couldn't talk to love. <clears throat> so what I did at that time is I had all these books from Salina Bookshelf. Um, I bought a lot of books. I was reading from those books. So I decided to take those books with me and read them to her. So I read them to her. And um, reading it for yourself, reading it at home, is very different than when you're reading it to an audience. And um, one, I was able to spend quality time with Manali when she was older and when probably not a lot of relatives were visiting because she wasn't as active. Two, um, reading it to her and having her audience and hear, hear her hearing it and seeing her face respond to certain things. I'm just, I'm just thankful for that time that I had. And I would say that one thing you can do is if you don't have any um, grandparents, um, once COVID opens up and once they allow people to go to nursing homes, I think it would be good to take those books from Salina Bookshelf to nursing homes and read to the elderly. They would appreciate that context. They would appreciate that involved. Um, and not only that, um, you can ask, it can, it, it can lead you to that opportunity to ask questions on questions that you have in that room and they'll have that time to explain it to you. Um, so that's, when I worked at the nursing home, there was a lot of elderly who didn't have a lot of visitors. Um, I worked as a CNA over in, um, um, Albuquerque, and I, I know that they would, uh, the elderly there really appreciated visits, even if it was, um, so I would recommend that because I, I really got a lot of, out of that with me. Mm -hmm. um, another person for Alicia Logan, for what does your family think about all you have accomplished with getting the Navajo language out? Um, I got an email from my mom yesterday. Um, she was telling me that she was really proud that I've really, I've really um, tackled, and like I've really, really, really got into the Navajo language. And I think at first I was doing more words and I wanted to post the fun things like how to say texting and then the, uh, the language changed where there's actually a word for texting now, but that wasn't in existence when me and my relatives were playing around with the words. Um, then I realized that it's not, now that time is progressing, a lot of the people who used to speak only don't speak that level anymore. So if you've seen my latest videos, I've really taken a step back to really say simple things like how to turn on a TV, how to turn on the stove, how to turn on and off the lights. Those basic things, yeah, it would be fun to learn how to say astronaut now. It would be fun to say, um, to say ecosystem in Navajo, but you would be learning one word for one scenario, as opposed to being able to actually say something in context. So I'm trying to post things while people who actively speak the language are here and I can share that from them of how the language is being spoken now. So I like to 
I like to post more in regards to, I really, my biggest project that I've always wanted to, to really tackle is posting a video on handling verbs, objects that rest, and using the visuals that I've done in my videos where you have the word and the visual. Because I think that when you see it and hear it and read it, you're integrating all three things and it's really helping you learn the language. And I've been I've been holding off on that because I know it's going to be a big project and I'm still trying to organize how I want to do that one. But that's my bit, my next big project uh, is to actually really talk about handling verbs and talk about um, objects at rest and how do you how you do all of that. Hi. <laughs> that's that's Hi. Where oh. I want to go with that. Um, and let me see, somebody put on, oh, um, do you consider that as a spiritual language or at least in the same light as elders have when they were young? Yes, <clears throat> I do think of it as a spiritual language. Um, I've, when I hear elderly speak specifically, I mean, from healthcare, I guess kind of in that context of, um, I guess, uh, Somebody had asked what's difficult about, about the Navajo language um, and things that I currently practice. There really is, a, you can tell somebody's level of traditional knowledge based on the words they use. And I like to use the example of medicine. If a person is very traditional and they're gonna say, you're gonna get medication, the time, if they're traditional, you tell them is that not hot with leaf medication will be put on you, um, as opposed to or you're gonna get if you're gonna get seen, you um, is that not hot with leaf you're gonna get treated. If a person has a more modern view set, then you would say didn't know if you're gonna get looked at. But sometimes you wouldn't use that for a really old elderly person that didn't know if you're gonna get looked at. So based on the verbs, kind of how the person is using their words, I can tell that I have to approach one person differently than the other. If they say, they didn't know if you're gonna get looked at. If I'm counseling that person, I can tell them this medication will raise your blood pressure, this medication will do these things. If they're using more traditional terms. I can't say you have diabetes. I can't say you have high blood pressure. That's kind of like me putting a curse on them. So I have to say, this is your blood pressure. This is your sugar level. If a person has a sugar level like this, this is what you expect. If a person has high blood pressure, this is what you expect. This way I tell them about somebody else imaginary. Because if I tell them directly, this is going to happen to you, you're going to die. They're going to say that that person, that pharmacist is there, he cursed me and I don't want to come back. So in terms of the language being sacred, yeah, people think of it as sacred and they have to be very careful. There was a doctor who, um, a nurse practitioner, she's, uh, she, got, she was telling me that she got, um, she was climbing up the mountain and she was um, throwing up her poles and she got struck by lightning. So just for fun, I was calling her a stumble with snip, which means she got struck by lightning. The woman who got struck by lightning is stumble with snip. I said that in front of a patient and because she was struck by lightning, that patient didn't want to be seen by that provider anymore. All of these things really have a role in the things that you say. I worked when I was over in, um, when I was over in Totalina, I, I made a slight blunder in, in Navajo when I said, um, I guess she was working with a pharmacist and needed medications. And I and she thought I was that person. And instead of saying, I wasn't working at that time. I said, it sounds like I didn't exist at that time, like I was dead. And it scared her. So all so being specific on how you're saying things, versus and then one, it shows you that example, like um, when you're wrong, you learn from it. Two, it shows us that our 
our language is very sacred that saying slight blunders can make a very big um, difference to the elderly. So yes, I think that our language is sacred. I think that we have to be very specific. And I think that's why with my, my, my videos, I tend to branch out and if you saw my video on masks, when I'm saying you can use it in this and this and this context, I'm trying to set the parameters that we have to be very careful about how we use our language. When I did the video about condoms, I thought I was being groundbreaking, but I didn't realize that was insulting. Some now it was because I was mentioning topics that shouldn't be blasted out in public. It's a useful video, but some for some people that's a very sensitive topic. So yes, our language, I think our language is safe. Um, Hi, Terry, and, I have a couple of questions for you sure. before we move to the next. I was wondering if you'd be able to share an example of, of your work, you know, maybe one that's um, received like the most positive feedback um, and then maybe an example of one of your work that you've done online that's your favorite and why you enjoyed it. And another example of one that was challenging and how you navigated those challenges. So that's kind of hard to say. I really, I put a lot of work into my videos. I think the one that I really, really liked doing was the, the last one on masks. Um, you can't tell from that video, but that was shot from different areas. A portion of that was shot in Fort Worth, Texas. A portion of it was shot at the um, Cowboy Museum. My parents got invited to a jewelry show where George Strait and Reba McIntyre were invited to. So I was three feet away from Reba McIntyre. George Strait was being honored with an award. And at that same gala, my parents got to sit in that gala and see George Strait receive his award. So when they were setting up those curtains, that was the curtains for the event. And at the same time, Robert Duvall um, from Lonesome Dove was actually there um, being honored with an award as well. So we got to see him later that day. But you don't see all of that. And some of the footage that I shot at was in Oklahoma City at the mall. And then, like I said, in Fort Worth, Texas, and then in Albuquerque, and then um, here in Farmington. It was a culmination of different places all put in one. So the viewer doesn't know that there was a lot of footage background taken. Um, some of the footages were taken from different hotel rooms that we were staying at along the way. So it was really fun to collect it because I was I had this vision of how I wanted to put this massive picture together. And then all of a sudden seeing it come together exactly the way I wanted to. And at the end, um, having my parents watch it my um, my aunties from my dad's side and 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 get their approval on it that was a really good amazing feeling in itself so i would say probably the last one is probably probably up there another one would have to be when me and my brother um went to buenos aires to um, break down the word of where the word navajo comes from so um, we know that Navaja means blade, and they've they told us they told us um, at one time that to say Navajo means stabber, person who stabs. When we tried to get them on camera, nobody on camera wanted to admit that that Navajo means stabbers, and that's how you understand it. So, Tanya June Raphael, she's a famous silversmith, and she is the one that mentions it at the beginning of that video. She said it means stabbers, and she is absolutely correct but we couldn't get anybody from Argentina to say it. There was a group of kids who were there. And when we were telling them what Navajo meant, one of the girls said Navaja. And then when we tried to record her, she stopped talking. She didn't want to say anymore. I figured she knew where we were going and she went with Vincent. Now, a lot of people who watch that video, they'll say that the video, the, the word actually comes from, um, Nav um, comes from, Apache de Nabu, meaning like people of the cultivated fields. Nobody really knows that me and my brother went to all the existing Tewa speaking villages. We went to Picaris, we went to Nambe, we went to San Aldefonso, we went to those villages to get current Tewa speaking 
um, Tewa speakers, Tewa speakers to break down the word for us. Nobody would talk to us. Um, we actually um, kind of got escorted off of the Picaris Pueblo by the security guard. Once they know that, we, once they had learned that we were, we were um, trying to get information on their language and culture, um, they politely asked us to leave. Now, when we went to San Alfonso Pueblo, we were actually able to sit down with the governor and we were actually able to sit down with their cultural person who told us at least that Navaja in Pueblo means that piece of land over there, Navaja. That's what it means in, in Tewa, that piece of land over there. Then when we asked him, can we get you on camera saying this? He said, no, we will not, we will not get any of this on video. So we shot footages of me in front of parts of the village that we could record where it had sign names. Then we were gonna post that portion that we tried to go to the Pueblo villages to figure out that portion of the name Navajo. Well, what had happened is I lost the flash drive to that. Plus another flash drive that had another project that I was doing at the time is I was going to every town on the reservation saying the name of that place in that area. I went to all parts of the reservation. I went to Alamo. I went to White Horse. I went to Cameron. I went to Bide Way. I went to all these places all over the reservation, Twin Lakes, um, Tonalia, everywhere, any, anywhere that there were Navajos, a Navajo mountain, um, even to Paiute Farms. We went to everywhere, me and my brother, we went to Chayahi, that came in way past um, Navajo mountain to Chayahi. And I lost that flash drive. And it was a whole accumulation of one year of work. And it would have been an amazing video. <clears throat> and the thought of having to do it all over again. Um, there was even some great footage of the uh, security guard from, from um, Alamo School telling me about local names of the area, telling me about um, different stories. It was all on there on one flash drive, um, but we lost it lost everything including the footage on on what that Navaja means that piece of land over there in Tewa so that would have been a great video but it never really it never really um, came into play but I think that would have been a really good video to post but I think the the video in Argentina um, getting that um, my brother actually um, studied in Argentina and that's how we ended up going down there for a wedding. And that's how we were asking people about um, Navaja and blade and stabbers and knife. And, but once we tried to get them to admit to what they were saying on camera, they took it all back. Anyway, it was, those were, those, that was a really good experience. And that was a really fun video to do because I don't, I don't know when I'm going to actually head down to Argentina again. And let me see, what else is there? Sorry, I got um, sidetracked there. Um, and in terms of somebody put in here, if you really want to have fun trying to translate popular songs, my sis and I like to do that on long drives. I had fun doing that. Like um, when I thought of Britney Spears' song, You Drive Me Crazy. So to say, You Drive Me Crazy in Navajo, you would say, Sit na chefance. And the syllable is just right. You drive me crazy. So if you wanted to be Britney Spears when it comes to that part, you can just, you can just say, <laughs> So we, we had fun with that too, trying to come up with um, like ways to translate things. And I thought that would be fun to translate Britney Spears as you drive me crazy entirely in that movie. But um, that's the, that was the hard part was trying to think about how to say you drive me crazy. Sit not your difference. That's how you would say it. Um, but then I'm thinking about other things like how you would say um, um, like um, what is her song? What is her um, 
um, I Fall to Pieces by um, Patsy Klein. Um, but it sounds kind of weird and funny, but I don't know. It's it's interesting to think about how you would try to say those things, but we have, I had fun with some of those um, phrases as well. So um, that's how that um, other video came out with um, how to say, um, sing, um, we translated one song into Navajo. Um, we heard Prince Royce um, sing in English and Navajo, let's sing in English and Spanish, um, Stand By Me. And when I heard that version of English and Spanish, that's when I thought, hey, it would be nice to, to, to sing that in Navajo. I wrote out my version, then I got some corrections from my dad and that's just, and it was just lyrics that were just sitting there, just sitting there. And then um, my cousin came by, um, Jared, he was from Torio, he came by and he was playing his guitar and he was playing Stand By Me. And I was like, oh, oh, oh I have the lyrics, let's do this now, let's just do this. And we really didn't rehearse that one. We just kind of recorded it and posted it. And it was totally, um, it was, uh, we didn't plan for it. It just kind of fell into place. It was totally spontaneous. That's why you can hear my mom cooking fried bread in the background because we just happened, to, she, he just happened to be playing in my, um, in my mom's trailer, my mom's house, in, our, in the workhouse. And essentially he started playing the song. Then I thought, hey, I have the lyrics. Let's just do this and have fun with this. Let's sing this song. And it just came together. It was just a one shot. We recorded it. I, I thought it was fun. We posted it. And that's how that whole Stand By Me came out. But it was originally because I heard Prince Roy sing it in English and Spanish. And I thought, hey, we need to like do that in Navajo for fun. <clears throat> and essentially, um, somebody put a um, comment about how they never thought about the medication example, and it depends on the speaker. And that's true. You really have to, when you're speaking in Navajo, you really have to think about the audience. And I think I skipped one. Do you think the language is changing, modernizing? Yes, I do think it's changing. Um, I think the, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I think that the language, that the language evolves. I think a lot of people really get upset with the word zongle. And even that is interesting how it evolved, zongle. So it's originally supposed to be odd zongle, Todd Zoggle, like um, um, you're lying or you're kidding or Todd Zoggle. And then after that, people shortened it to Odd Zoggle. And then now people just say Zoggle. And then sometimes you'll just see that on Facebook Zoggle. But some people get really upset that people now just say Zoggle as opposed to Odd Zoggle, Zoggle, rather than putting the whole thing in their Odd Zoggle. And now it's just Zoggle. I think, I don't, I don't think it's wrong that people say that the language will change. It'll continue to change whether we, we, we like it to or not. Um, I think I had posted one time that um, in Sali, um, some people will say Bithnarel to say somebody is high, Shithnarel. And there's no R's in Navajo. There's no R's in the Navajo language. But for some people as slang, they'll say if not real for, for getting high. And I'm not saying that's not Navajo. I don't know where it came from. I don't know who started saying if not real, but it came out of somewhere. Um, but it's, it's gonna change. And um, at this point, um, I like to follow how it changes, why it's changing, what it used to be. Um, and I think the, well, I guess it'll be interesting to see how the language decides to evolve on its own. And um, somebody had put in here um, outside upcoming projects outside of YouTube. Um, right now, I don't know. Um, I think uh, I think what we had talked about in terms of language preservation is that um, I think. Um, other platforms could be utilized, such as TikTok. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be jumping to TikTok very soon because I like describing things longer, but I would like to see some native Navajo speakers on TikTok. 
I think um, it would be good to see that people on TikTok. Um, and that brings to mind another thing. Um, some people had wondered where I had been for so long, because it seems like I had just disappeared from YouTube. So what had happened is I basically became a supervisor. Once I became, I was the pharma staff pharmacist. I became the chief pharmacist of Saley Health Center. Once that occurred, I was working really hard. I was working long nights. I was working be, oh, beyond, there was tons of overtime that I did not document. Um, and I was just trying to make my job work and I was focusing too much on my job. There were times when I would come home at eight or nine o'clock um, to get the work done. I really could have done better I should have really um, delegated tasks to other people, really made other people work. Um, if you know me as, in person, I'm not a person who's very confrontational or um, I'm not a mean person. Um, if people, I really, if people don't do the work, I'll absorb some of that work, which is not the best thing to do. By doing so, it caused me to, to work too long and um, I got stressed out of my work and that's kind of where I disappeared is that I was basically a supervisor and um, I didn't have time to really do anything um, outside of that free time. I didn't have that. I didn't have any creativity because all of my energy was invested into work. <clears throat> and let's see. Um, and I like what somebody had put is that Navajo changes because it is a living language. Um, and I think that's true. I think the fact that the, if the language is changing, at least it's alive in some way, it's continuing to evolve where it needs to. And I, I for Gordon Broninsky, I, I totally agree with your comments on that. And there are tons of Navajo speakers on TikTok. I, I mean, I there are, I don't want to um, say that there, there aren't, I just can't think of their names right now. And I even posted, um, there was one guy who's in the military who talks about dealing with depression and emotion. And um, I saw that, I liked it. I posted it on the Navajo Facebook page that exists. Um, and I'm not, I mean, and I'm, there are tons of speakers and there even, there's even a speaker who's from overseas who is learning Navajo. And she talks about a book that she wants um, that, is only available online. And I try to look, I have a copy of that book. I don't know if I want to give her my own copy, but I've been, I've seen it elsewhere. I've been Ellis Tanner. I've been trying to find it so I can get it to her. But anyway, there's tons of YouTubers out there. I mean, TikTok. Um, um, I don't know how to, how you would say that. People on TikTok. There's a lot of those people out there and I, I hope they do more and I hope it really gets out there. <clears throat> and for, for my advice for people who are hesitant to post themselves speaking Navajo on social media, um, that's kind of really going to be up to you to when and if you want to do that. I highly encourage people to get involved with speaking Navajo on social media. The one thing I would say is if you say something wrong or incorrect, um, don't, and you get a lot of criticism, take the criticism positively learn from it, learn from your mistakes if you say it wrong. Don't, don't feel bad about it at all. Um, and the thing is, with criticism, people who are the most vocal are the ones that criticize you. The ones who are your supporters tend to be silent. Just know that there's a lot of people who are supportive of you, who are silent out there. And the reason I know that is, it's those people that I come across at the flea market in the mall saying, I watch your channel, I watch it with my, my kids or my grandkids. And they're not posting on there their names and um, they don't post in the comments who they are, but it's after the fact, after I run into them, after I see them at one of my parents' shows, that there's a lot of supporters out there who, who, who really like what you do, even though they don't make it visible through their YouTube comments or through TikTok comments, if that's what you were media purposes.
Are there any other questions? Do we have any other questions from the audience? If you want to ask it vocally, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, type it in the chat. Did you um, did you answer the one about how can scholars and education technologists collaborate with speakers and knowledge holders to contribute to re to revitalization of traditional cultural forms of knowing in the language that embed embeds it? Hmm. Did you answer that one? Um, I I think I did here and there. Okay. Uh, I was just trying to see if we missed anything. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, question, Nicholas Belmore, question above. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I, I, I guess it was okay. that question. Um, I mean, so in terms of, um, scholars and education technologists. Um, <clears throat> I was watching, um, I, my interest in language isn't just with the Navajo language. I really, um, I go through those um, um, the pa um, Athabascan language conference videos. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but the Athabascan language conference posts their videos online and things that they discuss. I think their most recent one that they had before COVID was over at Camp Verde, when the focus was more on the um, um, San Carlos Apache. And one of the presenters was showing a lot of the videos that they were doing um, for the youth trying to engage in that. Um, it was very nice. It was, it was very, it was, it was, it was beautifully said. Um, the thing it was, it was only in Apache, and there was no, um, there was no captions or there was no words. And I think that to really harness technology, that we got to remember to include the captions in there, so that you know what you're saying, or if you're if you can do the sentences, include that so you can visualize the word breakup. But I like that they're doing that. I like that the Apache tribe is investing in that technology and doing that. I'm glad that they're they're really um, putting effort into doing that. And when I had seen what they were doing, I was I was proud of, of their work. And I know that we're doing that on the Navajo Reservation. And I guess just just doing that more um, expo that more exposure. Um, and in terms of traditional culture, I, I I know that a lot of that feeds through KTN and especially on culture nights. But then I think embracing other me uh, mediums that people are actively engaged in like TikTok, I think going into other mediums would be a good way to, to, to send that out as well. I think scholars are used to more of a classroom approach, a written a, a approach, but the people that we're trying to reach who, are, who really need to hear this are the people on TikTok. So I am very supportive of TikTok. I just haven't gotten involved with that form of me, um, social media yet, but I think that would be a good way to kind of share that traditional and cultural knowledge. Okay, we have one last question. Um, do you find yourself thinking more in Navajo? <clears throat> I was really happy when I, I was, when I started dreaming in Navajo. That was, um, I think the one time, the first time that I, 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 um, I dreamt like that. I told my mom the next day, like I, I dreamt in Navajo. And I think that's when I was really making the transition of really seeing things, um, understand, like thinking first in Navajo. And it used like the ability to think more in Navajo was more natural when I was working in the center of the reservation. Um, I don't speak Navajo as much living in Farmington, so I'm trying to, to read more, but yeah, when I first, dreamt in Navajo that was 
that was amazing. Sometimes when I need to say something, I'll think of the, the phrase in Navajo first. And then I'll think how, like, if I'm at work and I'm telling somebody something, they ought to and So sometimes I'll think about it first because um, I'll, I'll, like, um, the other technicians, Ramona or Nancy, will be there. But when I'm talking to my other coworkers, that'll come first. And I'll have to think about, um, get that back to me. Um, so sometimes that'll come first. Um, and I, I like that it's happening. Um, and I'm thankful for that. Um, the one thing that I'm very thankful is there are times when I dream of my grandma and my grandma will talk to me in Navajo. And um, in those dreams, I don't, I don't have dreams that she's, she's dead or she died, but we'll have a conversation that she's headed into Gallup, that she's selling something and I'm telling her to just be safe, that sort of thing. But I'll, she'll talk to me in Navajo when I'm sleeping. Um, and I, and I, I treasure those dreams as well. Okay, I think our hour is up. Thank you very much, Terry. Does anyone else have another question that they're just really would like to ask before we wrap up here? <laughs> if not, then we will um, wrap up. Uh, thank you for your questions, everyone. Um, there were a lot of great quest questions in the chat box. And thank you for yeah. coming to our very first Diné Culture Night of the semester. Our next Culture Night will be in November and we'll be hearing from another YouTuber. I, th I think he's called a YouTuber. Um, but tonight, eh, yeah, we had um, Mr. Terry Teller. Uh, uh, so um, thank you uh, to Terry for, you know, sharing his work with the Nebizad and his process of how he learned and how he, you know, started engaging, interacting with uh, the Nebizad. And, you know, he, he has all intentions of sharing his work and helping other people learn. Um, so um, to our Navajo 1110 students, you know, don't be discouraged, you know, keep on working on your Denebizad. And like Terry said, the only way to learn is to make those mistakes. So don't be afraid to make those mistakes. And you will all soon be YouTubers yourself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll see you guys soon. Mm -hmm. Maybe be on TikTok or something like that. I'll so, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to um, Daybreak Warrior. He's on YouTube. We put a link in the chat box. And he is also on Facebook as Daybreak Warrior. Am I correct? Yes. And on right. Instagram, maybe? Um, and Instagram as well, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So um, look him up and, you know, follow him and learn, learn um, some Navajo, learn Navajo from him as well. Hakoshi, um, a quitted or less. A do Hakonia.